Hi, everybody. Welcome back. If you want to all take your seats, we are going to get started with our afternoon's program. I hope everybody is well fed. And I mean, actually, I think I normally tell people that I hope that they're energized from lunch, but I think we had actually a pretty energetic session this morning, and everybody should be all gung ho and ready to go. So we're going to start this half of the program sort of switching it up since we had been doing a lot of uh, singular performances up here. Um, this uh, first program, we're going to have a conversation between Megan Miller and uh, one of the founders, Will Roger Peterson. So to introduce Megan Miller, uh, Megan Miller found her way home to the Black Rock Desert in 2009 after working for environmental protection, HIV AIDS protect prevention, political campaigns, and the US Senate. Uh, she currently acts as Burning Man's Director of Communications, overseeing media and public relations. And she is gonna be leading a conversation with Will Roger Peterson. Um, Will joined Burning Man as a volunteer in 1994 and became a founding board member of Burning Man's first LLC in 1997. Will founded Burning Man's Department of Public Works, the DPW, uh, the team of several hundred people responsible for Black Rock City pre-event and post-event construction, logistics, and production, a huge job. Uh, he is a founding board member of the Black Rock Arts Foundation and Burning Man Project, so um, please welcome Megan Miller and Will Roger Peterson. Hi, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. I, uh, I just want to get started actually by thanking Nora and, of course, Stephanie and the entire Renwick team. I think we can all agree that No Spectators is an incredible feat, and we've enjoyed it tremendously. Yes, a round of applause. I also want to thank the five cultural founders from Burning Man that are here and all of our staff. Uh, we are still getting the dust out of our hair. It's been straight from the playa to, to DC, so um, we're a little bleary-eyed, but we're really happy to be here. And, uh, and thank you for all taking the energy and the time to, to make this possible. So Will. You yes. <laughs> you are the first of Burning Man's six cultural founders that I had the pleasure of meeting. It was 2011, and I was a volunteer at the time. I was immediately struck by your kindness, your compassion, and your wisdom. And I'm excited that the audience is going to get a chance to know you a little bit better over the next half an hour. Wow. <laughs> I guess you saw my good side. <laughs> So let's dive in. Uh, you found Burning Man in 1994 through your partner, longtime sweetheart, Crimson Rose, who we heard from this morning. Crimson, you were amazing. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about those early days. And I also want to hear specifically, what was it about the energy and the spirit of what was happening out there that made you want to get involved? Um, well, uh, I had met Crimson uh, about a year before. Uh, I had a photo studio in Rochester, in, uh, in Oakland, and uh, she became my muse, one of my models, and she wanted me to go to Burning Man in 1993, and I said, uh, no way, it's the desert. I don't want to camp in the desert. I was, I was an experienced camper. I, I had walked the Sierra Nevada Crest Trail and most of the Appalachia Trail, and I was really good at camping. And, I asked her if there was trees that I could hang my hammock on, <laughs> and she said no. And then she came back that year. Uh, she took my 4 by 5 camera out there and took uh, images, and I helped her develop them, and I looked at them. And there was a magic to it. And, and the, her stories were like beyond the belief, you know. And, and so I was immediately attracted to the magic and to the mystery of what it might be to go to the desert. And, and I went out in 94, and I remember Crimson used to climb the man back then with these beautiful silk wings on, which are actually in the Renwick show. And uh, she got me to climb the man, and I was barefoot for three days, and by the end of the three days, my feet were all cracked to the bone. I could hardly walk. 
and I went over to a, a camp to get some salve for my feet. It was the Lake Lahontan Yacht Club, which is one of the first theme camps, right? And, and they sat me down on a lawn chair, and they put horse bomb on my feet. I'm actually going into the position. And uh, I began to look around, and instead of this blank, flat, lifeless, featureless plain, I'm looking at old Razorback and the Calico Range and the Granite Range. And it became um, a destiny for me to get involved with the rest of the desert, with, with the rest of the Black Rock Desert. And I've been doing that for 25 years. So that, that was the beginning. Crimson brought me to Burning Man. So I want to jump ahead. Thank you for bringing him. <laughs> I want to jump ahead to 97, which was a big year, both for the organization and for you personally. You took on an interesting role that year. Can you tell us about that role and about what happened in 97? Can I tell a long story about, about how we got there? Okay. We have time. So I was a volunteer in 94. There was 2,000 people. It was a camp out with friends. There was no city plan. There was no streets and roads. There was no emergency services. The big camps brought out their own porta potties and we learned how to do the Playa Smear, which I won't go into it, but it was a way to deal with your waste that was legal. <laughs> and uh, it involved lighter fluid. <laughs> and, <laughs> just imagine that, okay. So, so basically, we, we were, it was a camp out with friends. It wasn't uh, Black Rock City, it wasn't a community, really. The, the footprint of 94 was probably 20 times larger than the footprint of Black Rock City today. That's how dispersed the camps were. Airplanes were landing wherever they wanted to. It was like, it was different. <laughs> it was cacophonous. Um, it was also exciting, and, and, and it, so 94 was 2,000 people, 95 was 4,000 people, 96 was 8,000 people, still without rules, cacophonous, strange, but with too many people. So stuff happened in 96 that we are regretful. You know, things happened. People got injured. Um, we no longer could run it from uh, the idea that it was just a camp out with friends. We realized at some point, you know, in the, the next year that we needed to have some organization. So after the 96 event, and that's when Larry started the theme, so the theme for 96 was the Inferno, and the play that we did in San Francisco to raise money for the, the event was called Hell Cove. And Hell Cove was run by the devil, and Hell Cove tried to buy Burning Man from Larry Harvey, and Larry wouldn't sell. And that was the basis of that story. And uh, I played Mr. Clean. Um, I was one of the board of directors of Hell Cove in the play. And that's my playa name to this day, is Mr. Clean. And there was Aunt Jemima, G.I. Joe, Barbie. We were all on the board of directors. And so Helco was aptly named. It was, uh, it was actually a difficult year. It was a crucial year in that many of the early uh, Cacophony Society people that were part of the organization at that point, they quit and said that Burning Man would never happen again. And so at the BLM meeting where that was stated, Larry turned to me and he said, Will, would you do desert operations next year? And I said, sure. <laughs> desert operations to that point was drawing a 100-foot circle and putting the man in the center and then <laughs> smoking a joint, you know? I mean, I, <laughs> I mean that's what it was, right? And, and so, so I thought, boy, yeah, I'll do desert operations, cool. You know, little did I know that we wouldn't get a permit for 97 to do the event on the Black Rock Desert. We had to uh, apply for a Washoe County Festival permit. Those are affectionately known as the anti-Woodstock ordinance, right? And so they had 105 things that we had. We never dealt with any of this before, including uh, numbered campsites, uh, parking areas, uh, flush toilets, lit street corners, street signs. I mean, I had to make all this stuff up. And, 
And so it turns out that the compliance officer from Washoe County for the 97 event, he was a burner. And so when he said, uh, what about the flush toilets? I pulled up in a pickup truck with a flush toilet. <laughs> and he said, what about the lit street corners? I pulled up in a pickup truck with a shop light and a generator. And I said, which corner do you want me to light? <laughs> and so at, at some point, he's like, OK, I understand. You're going to do this whether we allow you or not, right? And so we went ahead with it. And it happened to be on the Fly Ranch, which was remarkable. And uh, we were making it up as we went along. Um, and it caused something, a synergism to happen that was maybe the most important step that Burning Man needed to take. And that is that six people came together and founded the company, Black Rock City LLC. And it was um, Larry Harvey, who was the philosopher, the, the leader. It was uh, Marion Goodell, the communications person. Uh, she, she had a great experience in that. It was Harley Dubois, who ran the community services department. And that was burgeoning. That was growing. Uh, Crimson Rose ran the art department. Uh, Michael Michael was the, uh, the, the head ranger in emergency services. And myself. And I, I had uh, experience in camping, but not in building a city. So the other thing that happened that year that was really seminal in our, in, our, in our growth is that I was able to bring in an old friend, Rod Garrett, the late Rod Garrett, and he, uh, the, the county required city designs. And so I asked Rod, I call him really quick from Empire, I had to drive 25 miles to use a phone in those days, and I called Rod and I said, Rod, design me a city. And three days later, he calls me back and he goes, Will, I haven't slept in three days. I don't know how to design a city. I've never designed a city before. <laughs> and so I began to show him what the regulations were, what we needed for a city. And he came up with this beautiful rectilinear plan that is the 97 site. And then the next year, he designed the one beautiful serpentine city for the 98 site. And then the rest is history. Rod's designs became iconic. Um, they're part of artwork and in collections and so on. So th the important thing, I think, in the transition was we went from 96 to 97 from a camp out with friends to Black Rock City. And we did it on the Fly Ranch, and that started my dream of, of uh, having the Burning Man community be able to use the Fly Ranch year-round. And, and, and that was a 20-year dream that actually became a reality two years ago. And I'm really excited about that. I'll, I'll just jump in there for those who aren't familiar with the Fly Ranch property. It, it's located about 12 miles north of Gerlach. It, the piece that we purchased is 3,800 acres. It has dozens of hot and cold pools, wetlands, tons of animal species. It's, it has a similar landscape to the Black Rock Desert, and yet it's a complete oasis. So it's both very similar and very different in its, um, in its energy. And like Will said, in 2016, we were able to purchase, we being the Burning Man Project nonprofit, able to purchase the property uh, with the help of 13 very generous donors who'd been involved with Burning Man and experienced Burning Man and wanted to share that gift uh, with the world. So since we're there on fly at the moment, um, do you want to say a little bit about uh, how do you, what role do you hope fly will play in the future of Burning Man culture? Well, well when I look at my experience at Burning Man, um, I call it proof of concept. So the concept is that we're all connected, that humans are born connected, and that culture doesn't want us to see that. And we, when we go to a place like Black Rock City where creativity is encouraged, um, there's freedom there that you don't necessarily feel from the constraints of our default culture. Um, it, it, it encourages you to feel like you're human with a bunch of other humans and you're connected together. So that's, to me, the goal. And we get that in Black Rock City for a week. Can we make it a year-round thing? Is it possible to have a community that lives in that heightened state for more than just a little bit and maybe a year-round thing? I think we're at a, a time in culture. I'm going to go into a little bit more of my personal philosophy. I, I think we've lived in a patriarchal um, 
greed-based culture for about 6,000 years when the Minoans started taking copper from mines and made bronze out of them, the Bronze Age. And, and if we look at the future, if we look at what the, the real hardcore environmentalists are saying is that if the temperature rises even a couple of more degrees, it's not going to sustain human life. So we need to begin to experiment with other ways of living on the planet that maybe are kinder and gentler and more loving towards the earth and to each other, and that's what you feel at Burning Man. And maybe we can do fly as, an ex as a social community experiment that might end up saving the world. Modest goals. So you've touched on this a bit. I, I really admire and appreciate your sense of place and your connection to the Black Rock Desert. You and Crimson have now made it your year-round home in many ways, and you spend a lot of time out there. What is it about this place? I mean, when, when we, and I, I'll, I'll use that term liberally since I wasn't part of the group that Michael Michael was with in 1990, but when we went out there, we went there because it was the middle of nowhere, because it was far away from everything and, and desolate and really an inhospitable environment. Um, and yet many of us have fallen in love with it, and I think you to, to a great extent. So can you talk a little bit more about uh, that landscape and, and why it's so compelling? Um, yeah, in fact, um, I would rather be in the desert than probably any other place in the world. Um, I think part of the success of Black Rock City is the environment. Um, it's either too hot or too cold, or it's too windy, or it's too dry, or it's too wet. Everything can bite you and sting you and poison you. It's like severe. In that severity, part of your ego is stripped away. And you become closer to what uh, Jung and Freud called higher consciousness. I call it consciousness. So I, I uh, yearn for the desert. There's poems written about it. There's movies been made. In fact, if you look at the monotheistic religions of the world, there's always stories or sources that come from the desert. It's a broad, mystical place. The Great Basin Desert is the largest contiguous desert in the in the United in the North America. It's dusty. It's um, has a 50 degree temperature change every day. It's severe and I love it. I just love it. Because it, 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 your, your inner voice gets stripped away, right? It, you, you become present. You, you, the sun sets, the sun rises, the closeness to the stars. You can see Andromeda, the next gallery, galaxy with the naked eye on the Black Rock Desert. Um, it's magic, and, and I, I'm very much attracted to the magic. And again, our culture doesn't want us to see that, because if we're in the magic, we're not consumers. You are an artist and an educator. And long before you joined Burning Man, you had a, had a career in teaching photography. And um, you have a tradition of going out and taking a photo every year. I actually had hoped this would be one of yours. This is not one of yours. This is from this year. Uh, but you take aerial photos of, of Black Rock City every year. Tell us about your relationship with photography and the lens and, that, and how that um, plays into your relationship with Burning Man. Well, I was an associate professor of photography at RIT. In fact, I taught a course called In Search of the Mystical Image. And one of my students from that course is here. Stand up, Paul. <laughs> and it was a real surprise to see him. I don't get to see, uh, that was over 25 years ago, so I don't, actually longer, 30 years ago. Oh. And, and, uh, but I've always taken pictures, even during my career with Burning Man, I always was doing something to keep my artistic uh, uh, um, juices flowing, you know, and one of the things that I started to do in 2005 was take an aerial photograph of the whole city um, every year. And I, it, the intention when I started that was to simply make prints for the staff. And I would do an edition of 200 and sign them and give them to the staff as a holiday present every year. 
And then after 14 years of it, I realized that I had a pretty substantial body of work. And I just uh, uh, I signed a contract for two books with uh, Small Works Press out of Las Vegas. And the first book is coming out this spring. It's called The Compass of the Ephemeral. And it's 14 years of uh, aerial photographs. And I also show the early plans that Larry drew and Michael Michael had input in. And, and uh, I believe Harley, uh, early on, the, the, de the designs of Rod Garrett, some of the ones that I rejected that I couldn't build uh, are in that book. So it sort of shows the, the history of the Black Rock City design. And then it shows from 2005 to 2018 how the city has grown. So it's an interesting book. I also have some details in it, so you'll get to see how the, um, what we call the cop shop, the, the law enforcement in encampment, how that has grown over the years. It'll show that. It'll show a bunch of other things. So I have some really good essays. Bill Fox from the uh, uh, Reno, or the uh, Mu Museum of Art in Reno. He runs their art and environment uh, program. He wrote an essay for it. Uh, Tony Coyote, the surveyor, he's, he, he uh, wrote an essay for it. And so my deadline is October 1st. What am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> we got your back. <laughs> uh, you, you touched on this earlier, but in, and now that you're talking about your book, I'm thinking about the evolution of the design of the city itself and the changes that were made over the years to accommodate for more and more people um, and also to make the city function in the way that we hoped it would um, and the way that people could really engage with. What are some of the changes that were made? What did you learn along the way and, and what changes were made to the city design? Well, the, in 97, uh, Rod, uh, again, I asked him that uh, I had worked for Rod as a contractor. Uh, he had a design company. And so we had an interesting relationship he would take on a job and do a design and he'd hand me the design. I'd do a material takeoff, go to the, you know, the lumber yard, get the materials, I'd go build it, and then he would come and check it, and that's how, how our relationship was. He would always hand me a design. Every design he handed me, I could build. And so when I asked him to do a city design, I was thinking about that relationship, not realizing that building a city was not like building a pergola or a deck, you know? So I was very naive, and, and I think sometimes innocence is a good thing to bring to a new endeavor, because if you knew the scope of it from the beginning, you probably wouldn't begin. <laughs> and, and clearly that was the case in 97. I had no idea I was innocent. And in that innocence, I had the determination to, to make it work, but Rod was giving me designs that I couldn't build. I didn't know how to do you know, complex curves and stuff in, in like a quarter of a mile distances and things like that. I didn't even have a, I didn't have a transit or anything. We were using, oh, a funny story. We started to lay out the city with a rope, you know, a hundred foot rope. We figure a hundred foot rope will do it. By the end of the day, the rope was 104 feet. <laughs> so everything was crooked, it was really funny. And so then we go, oh yeah, that's why they call it survey chain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was the way we learned. We learned, you know, on the ground, really the hard way. And, and uh, finally Rod came up, he wanted me to do these beautiful curves like an amphitheater. And we ended up with a rectilinear design that mimicked a curve, but I could, I could send the graders and the the heavy equipment to make the roads, I could send them in straight lines from stake to stake, rather than do a whole bunch of little, little things in between. So uh, we were running out of time. Uh, we didn't get the permit in 97 until the day before the event, you know? And uh, our population was not what we quite expected that year. We, we had to, it was my first year, I was the chief of staff, the controller. I was doing all the accounting, I was, trying to deal with a, a boy, a staff that lived under bridges the rest of the year. And I, I, had, I, had, a, I had a shock circus come in and they saved our day, but just dealing with them was a major challenge. And then I had the plans coming in from Rod that I knew I couldn't build. So at some point I had to say, okay, 
we're going to get on the ground. We're going to build it. It's going to be straight lines. We're, and Rod came up with this beautiful plan. And then the next year, we learned how to do the curves. And the 98 event had this, I don't know if any of you have seen the drawings or been to that event, but it was this beautiful serpentine drawing of annular roads, the curved roads, the straight streets, but they were in degrees, not in, not in uh, minutes like, like we have today. And it only went from 4 o'clock to 8 o'clock. So it was really open. And I think that's my favorite design. Um, as a drawing itself, j it's just a beautiful thing. I think I have one on my wall in, in Oakland. And, and uh, other than that, I if you look at the city, the annular roads, OK, at first I think there were six of them. Now I think we're up to like 10. I think it's about 10. So to increase the population, you just added on another annular road. I mean, and each one going out gives you much more camping space. So, because it's a much longer road. I think, the, I think it's almost two miles from one end to the other now out on L, the last road. So uh, it, it, Rod's design has proven to be you know, very you know, timely. I, it, 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 it continues to be the perfect design for Black Rock City. So over those 20 years since then, you've filled a number of different roles. You've, like many a Burning Man have learned by doing, as we all have had the opportunity to do that through this, uh, this experience. And you've just recently actually stepped down from being the chair of the board of directors from Burning Man Project. So what does that mean in terms of your relationship to Burning Man, your leadership, your contributions? Where are you at and what would you like to do next? Less meetings. Yeah, uh, our, our staff affectionately calls Burning Man Meeting Man. And uh, I, after 25 years of maybe six to eight meetings a week, um, I don't want to do any more meetings. And so, That's but I, I have some. I, I continue to work with the legal department as a senior advisor. I'll continue to work with um, Nevada Properties as a senior advisor and the Fly Ranch Committee. Uh, I'm on that. And those are great because. Uh, I don't feel like I have to attend the meetings, that I, I, can, I can do it when I need to do it or when they need me. So um, I, I'm at the point where I'm starting a new career, which, which is uh, uh, getting my artwork out there. And my second book is called In Search of the Common Shaman, and it's about my philosophy. That'll come out next November. So I want to focus on that. I mean, I'm 70 years old. I'm a good friend of mine who was the same age just died of a massive stroke. Larry. And, and so I, I look at the mortality of who we are as humans and how our culture denies death so much in our culture. We don't deal with it well. And I want to deal with mine well. You mentioned In Search of the Common Shaman, and I did want to have the audience get to hear a little bit more about that book project and, and why you think that message is so important for the world to hear right now. Well, again, we live in a culture that uh, it's pretty controlling. It's our language, you know, our inner voice. Everybody's got an inner voice. Some groups call it the already always voice. And uh, that's not who you are. It's a cultural thing. Our culture is not human. It doesn't celebrate humanity. Burning Man does. What, what makes us human is way more than what makes us male and female and black and white and Russian and American. Uh, two arms and two legs and two eyes and two ears. 95% of what we are is human, and yet our culture doesn't celebrate that. Burning Man does. That, again, the proof of concept. So my book is about that. It's about how we can get back to uh, dealing with the arch archetypal world that we're born with, that uh, as soon as we learn language, we lose. Um, Jung called it the collective unconscious. I call it the common consciousness. And when you're at Burning Man, and, and again, if, 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 I, if what I say rings true, give me an applause with this one. But at Burning Man, you feel connected to other humans more so than any other place in the world. Right? So, so and, and it's indescribable. So, so that there's many parts of Burning Man that, you know, your friends want to 
jibe you about being a burner and they, they want to hear what you have to say about it. But there's certain things about being in Black Rock City that you can't even describe. You can't talk about it. And one of them is this unconditional love that swells up out of the people at every sunrise, at every sunset, when the earth cycles are powerful, when the dust storm comes up, when those things rip your inner voice away and make you human, you can feel the love. And that's what my book is about. Our time has gone quickly, and we're almost out of it. I was going to ask, this is an image from this year. We were all just there, if you, if not necessarily all of you. I hope you all get to come if you haven't been yet. Many of us were there just a couple of weeks ago. What stood out for you in 2018? How well, did you feel about this year? Absolutely, after 25 years, this was the best Burning Man I've ever been to. Yeah. Oh, I'll tell you why. There was this strange synchronicity going on everywhere. You were always in the right place at the right time, right? Everybody that you met, you fell in love with, right? Okay, so I'm sitting in, in first camp, and you know, I'm an elder, so I smoke cigars and I give bad directions. It's great. Because <laughs> yeah. I figure if I give, get someone to just immerse themselves in the city, that's the direction they should go in. I, you know, so anyway, Carrie, who's here, walks into my camp and she's all hunched over, a beautiful goddess woman, all hunched over. She goes, Will, I, I need a chiropractor. I'm sitting next to the best chiropractor in, in California, right? So that was the first thing. I, I, well, what's the chances of that, right? So then right after she leaves, all standing up, looking beautiful again and, and proud, this guy comes in and he goes, I'm looking for Camp Jub Jub. And I go, oh, Jub Jub, not those guys. That's the fuck your day guys, right? And uh, they like to throw wrenches into any kind of process. They're great. And you can count on them. And I don't know one, I did not know one of where, where they were. So I couldn't help the guy. And he goes, look it, this, this man saved my life 30 years ago. I haven't seen him. I, I, I haven't talked to him. I heard he was at Jub Jub. I've got to see him. And I said, look, go over to Playa Info, and they'll tell you where Jub Jub is. I know it's a placed camp, so they have it on the map. So we have three cauldrons in my, in my camp, and he gets to the third cauldron, and the guy comes around the corner and hugs him from behind. You know? And that kind of thing, that was my first day. That was Monday of Burning Man. <laughs> And that was happening. Wasn't it happening to you? Yeah. So that, that's the kind of thing, that's the world we should be living in. That's, the, that's how it could be. Burning Man is an example of the best of humanity. And we can make it happen all the time. Well, I want to thank you for inspiring us all to be part of that vision of the best of humanity and participating in Burning Man. Thank you for all of your years of contribution and ongoing, and thank you for doing this today with me. Thank you. <laughs> that was great. Um, so speaking of the best of humanity, um, our next speaker is um, someone local here, J.R. Russ, a.k.a. Nexus. And, uh, yeah, Nexus was um, actually just serendipitously um, the first person that I met on my way to Burning Man. Um, I, I had heard his name locally when some of our folks had been over to a film that he was putting together here, and then I'm standing in line for the Burner Express bus at Reno knowing no one, and I hear somebody yell, Nexus, and, um, and there he was. So we became best buddies on the bus on the way in. So um, I am delighted to have him here today. So J.R. Russ Nexus is a DC native who started burning in 2013. JR is devoted to the district's creative community as a past board member for Story District and current board member for Dance Place. 
He's passionate about building community through the arts and addressing issues of diversity and equality, which has led to an ongoing storytelling project providing Burners opportunities to tell true stories on stage. And now he will tell you his. Hi. Uh, again, my name is Nexus, and uh, you heard a bit of what I do, and I thought, in addition to learning more about me as a burner, I'd actually tell you about me before I was a burner. Um, so before the burn. Art was always a part of my life, um, specifically the performing arts. I actually sang at, back when I was a soprano in the National Cathedral Boys Choir, and this is me actually singing at Justice Thurgood Marshall's funeral in 1993. There I am. <laughs> right place, right time. But it's one of those things where I realize the meaning of a moment is something that can continue to get deeper as you get deeper in yourself, in your art, in your community. Um, in case you don't know, St. Albans is the school that cathedral boys are supposed to go to. Um, it was actually started as a school for choristers, but uh, uh, St. Albans also produced people from Al Gore as a graduate to Jeffrey Wright who's a wonderful actor to one of my classmates, Brander Victor Dixon, who's a phenomenal Broadway star. Um, but less on the arts, more on the politics, doctors, all the typical DC stuff. Um, I was not a typical DC kid. And ever since then, I went on to pursue a life in the arts. I got my bachelor's in dance from the University of Maryland. I would go on to perform locally with uh, theaters like Studio Theater and Synetic Theater. I would even go back to the all boys school um, as a dance instructor, this is me actually, um, I didn't realize it, it's on a chorale trip to San Francisco in like 2009. And I go on to produce my own devised work in theaters as a kind of homage to my own life experience. Um, in the lower left-hand corner, it's a picture from a show called The Rave Scenes, kind of a, a little hat tip to the scene that inspired me to pursue dancing professionally. Um, and that was done as part of our local Capital Fringe Festival, uh, which brings me to another moment in time. Uh, that's me as an intern at Capital Fringe, their first. Um, I, I found myself working off stage as much as I was working on stage. Uh, sometimes I even had auditions where a director or mentor would be like, we didn't want to cast you in that, but do you want to be our touring manager? I'm like, I have no idea how you got that from an audition, but sure, <laughs> I can do that. Um, what was special about Capital Fringe uh, was someone I met there. His name was John Kevin Boggs. He was another actor, storyteller. He, yes, if you know John Kevin Boggs. Um, and he was like, there's a storytelling organization in DC. I think you might like it. And, and here's the thing. Up until then, anytime I'd been on stage, I was surrounded in an ensemble. I never wanted to be the lead. Um, I had choreography. I had a script and score. So the idea of being on stage by myself without a script is a little terrifying still. But I fell in love with it. Um, I ended up performing with them. I would tell a story about how I found my love of dance through the rave scene. Um, this is a picture of me in a Story District's first Pride show at Woolly Mammoth Theater. I told a story about how I came out in high school. I took my boyfriend to my senior prom in 1999 at an all boys school. <laughs> right. It was, it was incredible. And, um, in that year, in 2011, I would also move into the art space lofts, which if you're familiar with art space, yes, art space. Any other art space residents here? Yes. They're a nonprofit based in the Twin Cities, and they responded about three decades ago to artists being pushed out by being like, well, we need to build buildings for them to stay in that are affordable. And so I moved into the first one in BC. Um, and yeah. Over the years, I would continue working on and off stage, and this is... Um, a picture from a production of uh, King Arthur with Synetic Theater, which is known for their wordless Shakespeare adaptations. I share this not so much because of what was happening on stage, but what was happening off. The year was 2010. I just finished my master's degree in arts management. And after spending a summer uh, working on a thesis about how working performers defined arts advocacy and community, really like awesome, heady policy stuff, um, the show comes up and my aunt doesn't see it. Now, my aunt, uh, who is my mom's youngest sister, um, was my number one fan, next to my mom. 
Um, she would come see every show. And I remember when I asked my relatives and my uncle why my aunt wasn't there, all they said was she was sick. What they didn't tell me was while I was working on my thesis, she had tried killing herself several times that summer. What they didn't tell me was she had actually been seeing help uh, with depression since my grandfather passed away in 1999 when I was just taking my boyfriend to my senior prom. And a month or so later, um, after the most severe bout of depression, after being left alone for Thanksgiving, she would end up going to Tyson's Corner Mall with her family and her daughter and her granddaughter and would end up killing her two and a half year old granddaughter by dropping her off a five story walkway. So right place, right time. In this moment, in this time of my life, I was afraid I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. This whole time I thought I was doing my art for my family, for my friends, for my community, and this drove me in a terrible crisis of who I was as a person, as a member of my community, as a family member. Um, so I, I started stepping away from stage, uh, the stage more and more. Um, I kind of started doing some leadership stuff locally. It was another one of those, someone thought I would be a good fit. So I joined the steering committee for the Emerging Arts Leaders DC and I, I found something there. I wasn't sure what it was yet. Um, several years later, I found myself at Freeform Arts Festival. This is me singing karaoke because I'm part Filipino and we love karaoke. Um, what I didn't know is that the person who is the KJ is Debbie Arsno, who used to be a DC regional contact now in Florida. And I'm singing Purpose from Avenue Q, which I like to think my life is a musical, and so I sing the songs that I think are appropriate for that moment in time. And I was trying to figure out what my purpose was. Um, I got back from Freeform and quit a job. <laughs> Don't do that <laughs> after a burn. Um, and it was funny because all this time, like I'd been wanting to go to Burning Man for a long time. I had a, my best friend from my high school who was the first person I came out to shared pictures and she was actually involved with the drone project. Her name's Anima. Um, and I always thought I needed all these things in place to get to Burning Man, right? But here I was, jobless, living on credit, broke. And me and two friends who went there were like, let's just do it. Let's just drive out there. And we did. I'm never driving there from here again <laughs> unless I have like, like a couple more days. It's a 40 hour drive. We did it in 48 hours. Yes, <laughs> all of that. Um, so this is 2013, right? I quit my job, I have a lot of free time. I've also been singing with the Gay Men's Course of Washington and right time, right place, moments. Moments I, I've begun to realize aren't ever things that exist alone. It, it's how these moments connect to each other. And so 20 years later, after seeing at Thurgood Marshall's funeral, I find myself on the steps of the Supreme Court with the Gay Men's Course of Washington seeing in response to rulings on Prop 8 and DOMA. And we're seeing um, a song from Ragtime, uh, Make Them Hear You. And, and the song, the lyrics go, go out and tell your story, let it echo far and wide. Make them hear you, make them hear you. And the enormity of that moment and the moment that I had experienced 20 years ago, it was something that, that felt good, that felt real. It was a, another way of art as ritual, as celebration, not just of something that we've lost, but something we've gained. And so it's with all that, I go to my first burn in 2013. Whew. Wow. Um, that rolls. Um, I had gotten a ticket way after tickets sold out. It was one of those things I just like dove into the local community and someone knew that I was looking for a ticket and they were like, hey, two friends can't go and I go. And what's really funny is another best friend from high school Eric, literally, after I get my ticket, emails me, we haven't talked about this at all. Like, Burning Man has not come up on our radar. And he says, I just got a ticket to Burning Man. Are you going? And we end up camping together. Um, fun little, f so his name's Eric. We used to call him Erk in high school. I was Jer. And so whenever we met people, it would be like, hey, my name's Jer. And he'd be like, and I'm Erk, and together we're Jerk. Anyway, sorry, Preamble, you are not the first hybrid nickname that I've got. He came first. I love you, Preamble. Um, so, you know, my first part, I'm out there, I'm watching the sun come up at Robot Heart. Um, <laughs> in this photo, I'm pointing at Robot Heart, but what you can see is the person I'm touching is actually another DC burner I have not met yet. <laughs> and we do meet, and it's amazing. Um, I, I 
pass by Center Camp, I see where the performances are happening on the open mic stage. I see a project that I helped build when the, uh, Burning Man still did the core of regional effigies. So I actually helped with the DC core project, which I thought was really amazing because living here my whole life, and I'm sure whether you're visiting or you lived here too, it's like two cities in one. We've got the federal city and then we've got a thriving local scene. So I thought it was great that we juxtaposed this image on a dollar bill and inside there were two hammocks and it played music from local musicians which I thought was really neat. I discovered the Gaberhood. That was amazing. Um, yes, I had a, an ex from Pennsylvania who moved out who was actually camping with the Glamcocks. He was like, hey, come find me. I fell in love with comfort and joy. Um, and then I, I watched The Man Burn, which was a really, it was a very lonely night. I had some issues with my friends who I'd camped with and I found myself alone on like seven o'clock just wondering what I was gonna do with my night. And then a couple of folks from Portland who were involved with the Love Letter Bikes, and one who I met earlier had me coming by, and they're like, let's watch The Burn. And I was like, okay, yeah, awesome, exactly what I needed. Um, and so is this. Lightning, Sin, everyone else who worked on this. It's three years after everything happened with my family. It's two years after the trial happened, which pitched my cousin and the prosecutor against my mom and my family in the uh, defense. And I find myself here grieving for my niece, my two and a half year old niece, and just like losing it. And similar to some other stories you've heard, all I, all I feel is a hand on my back. And all I hear is someone saying, just breathe. I never saw who that person was. I didn't need to, but that was all I needed in that moment. Um, so that was my first burn. I've gone every year since. So after Burning Man, what happened? I return to Capitol Fringe with a vengeance, uh, bring storytelling and producing, and I go on to produce a show honoring uh, Burning Man and the Ten Principles, uh, putting DC burners up on stage, and there was a bit of both. It was supposed to celebrate our own community, but also to be advocates for people here who might not know about Burning Man except what they hear in the news. So hopefully next time they hear about Burning Man, they can think of these. I went on to help and work with burners for the following three years to produce the show. Um, it was great because Debbie also put me in touch with like Burning Man's I, uh, intellectual property department and trademark, making sure I wasn't doing anything wrong, which was awesome. Um, but we all gifted our time and effort. And for first timers who came to see our show over the past four years, we would donate our box office revenue to them to help them with their first burn. And that just felt amazing. <laughs> over the four years, I think we gifted about $3,000 some dollars to a couple dozen burners. And one of them, it, it's just great because it's one of those things, you're just planting seeds for all these moments to connect together. And when they keep happening and keep seeing people and you hear about their experience, like that, that was the most magical part. It wasn't even what happened on stage, right? It's what happened after the performance ended. It was hanging out at the bar and having people who saw you be like, wow, that reminded me of this. Or wow, I remember that moment. Or oh, I saw that art project. And then I get invited to the Global Leadership Conference, along with a whole bunch of other wonderful DC community leaders. You can see Debbie in the tall yellow hat. Um, and this was amazing, because it wasn't just about what we were bringing to the conference. So I brought a storytelling workshop, but also what I took back. I went to a consent workshop. And when I came back from DC, I dove head first into how to deal with consent issues and conduct issues in our local community. Um, so my playa name is Nexus, and I thought this was pretty amazing, because after my first burn, I love sci-fi, I found this book called Nexus by Ramez Nam, who happened to be the keynote speaker for my second GLC, and that blew my mind. I, it, it was like fate, um, and that was pretty amazing. I, I, I'm gonna paraphrase, I can't quote exactly, but I love something he shared in his presentation, which was the meaning of a thing, or the value of a thing, is uh, the change it affects on the world. Right? Um, you've ever heard about this next place that is affecting a lot of change. I was very humbled to be offered to visit Fly Ranch. I remember going to a conversation at Red Lightning, and a lot of it was how can we do here the thing we do in Black Rock City, but year round? And what I really loved about it was how is what we do there special? Like, so people could say, let's do a conference or retreat, but like, how about the land? makes that retreat a retreat like it couldn't happen anywhere else. And honestly, I took a lot of that back home with me here to DC because I, as the DC burner, want to know how this city informs the way I burn here the other 51 weeks of the year. Um, little side note away from Burning Man, uh, Artspace had this wonderful gathering called Breaking Ground, and I was invited to speak and share some of my own research and community from my thesis. 
Um, and I wanted to share some of this is going to be the really dry part of the presentation. But I thought these definitions, which I came across while I was looking at my thesis, were very, are, are things that still inform my own community building. The first, a community is a collection of people who interact together in the same environment, interactions which produce feelings of belonging. Two, to build community, we seek conversations where people show up by invitation rather than mandate and experience an intimate and authentic relatedness. Third, the social fabric of community is formed from an expanding shared sense of belonging. It is shaped by the idea that only when we are connected and care for the well-being of the whole that a civil and democratic society is created. In 2016, I realized I hadn't visited my aunt in five years. Over the years of the temple, I had let go of my niece. I had let go of my relationship with my cousin, and then I realized I had let go of something that was keeping me from visiting my aunt. Um, I had mentioned being afraid that I was in the wrong place at the wrong time in that show, and I realized that was guilt, and I realized it kept me from being in the only place she will be in for the next two decades with her in any moment I could. And so at the temple that year, I vowed to make sure not to just visit her after I got back, to visit her more regularly and every year until she gets out. Um, and not saying that I wouldn't have gotten there, but being at Burning Man without all the things that get in the way of you feeling yourself and your true and raw and authentic emotions definitely provided a space to get there quicker. Um, I love the GLC. I definitely met a lot of people I would not have met otherwise, like Pretzel. He's a glam cock. And we started talking about consent. And he was like, we're doing this workshop series. Can you talk about consent, especially consent in queer spaces? And I was like, yeah, of course you can. Um, Nora, you stole the story for the slide. <laughs> That's a picture of us at Burn Express at Reno, and that was just pretty amazing. Um, yeah, I, like literally for three to four hours. And what I loved about that, and not, again, not to say that it wouldn't happen otherwise, but we get back and we're like, how can the DC Burner community be involved in the exhibition to the point where our regional context did a Burning Man 101 for their doses? And I thought that was just really amazing. Um, Pretzel would go on to invite me to camp with the Glamcocks, um, which was a pretty amazing feeling there I am. In the, anyway, yes. Um, and I thought it was great for me because it was a very great, ex it was the first kind of home camp I'd had. I camped at Hoverlandia, which is a great bunch of misfits from all over the world. But being at this thing camp, really looking at how community informs identity, but also how do individuals inform community identity. Um, I was there with a partner for the first time, my beloved Compass, short for Compassion. We were poly campers, they were at Comfort and Joy. Um, and this is funny, uh, Compass is also from the area, uh, and we've definitely been in the same place at the same time, but that doesn't mean it was the right place at the right time. And we just started dating about six months ago, and it was definitely the right place and the right time. <laughs> um, and then here, back at Center Camp, this past burn, it's, it's funny because when I th think of Burning Man, I think, wow, this is actually the life I want to live the other 51 weeks of the year when I think about the other 51. Like, they're very much becoming like this, which is great. I had three storytelling shows, two consent workshops, one storytelling workshop. I hosted a Broadway sing-along. We're hosting a Broadway sing-along here at Local 16 in November because I had a great time at OK Not OK. Um, yeah, no, it's great. It's like the things I do out there, I'm like, more of that here. Um, and also, and I shared the story of my aunt again. And, and I realized a lot of why I burn is not only to, I realized something in addition to guilt that was paralyzing me from visiting her was that the fear of the day she would come out and not being ready to welcome her. And I realized part of that fear was I was afraid I would be welcoming her back into the world alone. And when I told the story at Center Camp, and I, I, what I love about Burning Man and what we do and, and the real and raw and authentic emotions and how we see and we hear and forgive each other for everything and love each other unconditionally is I, I hope to build a world that is also ready to welcome her back into it with open arms. All that being said, if I can leave you with anything else in addition to gratitude, right place, right time, you're here, you're now. Whether that is the right place or right time is up to you. Thank you.
Okay, that kicks off the emotional end of the afternoon. Um, so um, next up, um, we have a panel. We really wanted to set aside a little bit of time this afternoon um, to focus in on the artists, since this is really what the exhibition is all about. Um, so I have with me here four um, awesome, powerful <laughs> ladies that are ready to come up on stage. Um, First off, uh, I have um, my partner in crime, Kim Cook, who is going to come up and uh, interview three of the artists that uh, she works with with Burning Man. Kim Cook joined Burning Man Project as the Director of Art and Civic Engagement in December 2015. Managing the teams that deliver civic arts initiatives, Burners Without Borders, Burning Man Arts, including the Art for Black Rock City, and the growing global network of Burning Man communities and events. Previously, Kim held a position as president and CEO for the New Orleans Arts Council, serving at the intersection of the city's arts, culture, and civic life. Um, and Kim, do you want to introduce the artists, or shall I go on? All right. Um, so we have three artists with us today, uh, Kate Roudenbush, Caroline Miller, and Bree Hicksma. Kate Roudenbush is a Washington DC born, New York City based Burning Man bread sculptor who creates allegorical and immersive laser cut steel works such as Futures Past, which is on the cover of your brochure that you see and it's also in our local Golden Triangle Business Improvement District right now. So you can go visit her work afterwards. Uh, she, her work also incidentally inspired the lighting design for the 2018 Burning Man base pavilion. So um, if you were out on Playa, you also saw uh, an also a, a fantastic sculpture that was out there that was a tribute to Larry that was gorgeous. Uh, Carolyn Miller is a scientist by day, an artist by night. She's been a member of the collaborative art group, the Flaming Lotus Girls for 15 years. <laughs> Um, she, her work and the Flaming, Flaming Lotus Girls work is uh, on a video in our gallery in the upstairs hallway because obviously it is too large and too dangerous to bring into the museum. So we have to have Carolyn here um, to, uh, to translate that for us. And finally, Brie Hicks, he'll come out. I always mispronounce your name, apologies. Um, as a multimedia maker, instigator, and lead artist with the collective Five Ton Crane, and a producer at Obsolete Pictures, she still marvels at the strong friendships and community grown through collaborative projects. Her interactive work invites people to explore their own direction and at their own pace. And she was uh, the sort of lead artist on the incredible mutant vehicle that we have over in the museum right now, Capitol Theater. So uh, you still have an opportunity to go over and see that for the next couple of days. It's amazing and hopefully we'll see that out on Playa in a couple of years. In any event, please welcome the ladies. So now I'm on a microphone and I invite uh, you, Mills, and you, Kate, to have a seat. And Bree, you're going to be the first person speaking. So if you'd like to head to the podium. My name is Kim Cook. As mentioned, I'm the Director of Art and Civic Engagement for Burning Man, which is an incredible privilege. Um, it's an honor. It's a true honor. And I am a newcomer to the community. And having this opportunity to absorb and sort of just let into my pores the stories and the history of the founders is really an incredible moment um, for which I am extremely grateful and for which I would like to also take this moment to thank the Smithsonian American Art Museum, Nora Atkinson, Stephanie Stiebich, and a few others. But let's pause and just thank them for today. <laughs> Thank you. 
I also really want to thank um, the staff of the Renwick Museum and the Smithsonian American Art Museum writ large. I won't remember all of the names, but there's certainly everyone from this woman, Sarah Snyder, to Alana, who supports Nora, to Amy, who helped us articulate a lot of the communication strategy, to Jeff, who is a first time burner this year and managed the docent program. We spent many, many, many days and hours talking about how this exhibit could be representative of the culture um, and interactive and participatory. And um, Bart, would you mind standing up just as a case in point? Um, Bart is, uh, has not been to Burning Man, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, he uh, has been... <laughs> Uh, Bart is a museum docent uh, with the Renwick Gallery with the No Spectators Art of Burning Man exhibit and a great example that it is in fact possible to have a spirit and a heart aligned with the culture of Burning Man. <laughs> um, and not necessarily have had to go to the Black Rock Desert or Black Rock City in order for that spirit to be ignited. And I think that's a lot of the work of um, the departments that I get to participate in, which also includes Stephen Raspa and community events. Um, I wasn't mentioned in my intro, so I just wanted to mention that. And uh, you can have a seat, but he looks like he wants to tell us something. Did you want? It's, uh, it's been a, an extreme pleasure to be able to do this, because one of the things that is really eye-opening to me is that I'm able to talk to people at the exhibit and see that confluence of, of the Burning Man and then what Sam has been able to do and then being able to be a part of that. And people ask me, well, have, have you been to Burning Man? And yeah. I said, I am a burner because it's a philosophy. Amen. 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 Yeah. Amen. Amen. But I get, get to actually do that next year, which I'm looking forward to. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. That's so amazing. I, this is it, right? This is it. It's that we get to think about how this work lives in the world in many different kinds of ways, including Black Rock City, including the 85 regional events, including the more than 300 regional contacts, including 34 chapters of Burners Without Borders, including each individual who comes and participates in the city and re-articulates whatever that means to them out in the world like we just heard from Nexus. So many thanks to the Smithsonian, many thanks to the founders of Burning Man, and extreme thanks to each of the individuals who participate in this work. And now, after hearing a collection of stories that's been already rich and rewarding, we get to turn in the direction of three of many of the many, many fabulous and incredible artists making work. So our plan for this is to have each of the women um, make a presentation of about five to seven minutes long. There are a couple of questions or discussion items that we'll go through together and then we'll open up for um, Q&A. This session is supposed to run for an hour and a half, but it's also supposed to end at um, 4.15. So I'm gonna suggest that we end at 4.20, which will give us an hour and 10 minutes. Um, and you'll still have a 10 minute break, but we'll also reconvene at 4.30 and keep ourselves on track for the last part of the afternoon. Does that, is that? 420. 420. <laughs> <laughs> that will be our break time, officially. <laughs> All right, so with that, I would like to share this moment and invite Bree to share with us. Hi, uh, good afternoon everyone. My name is Bree Hilkema and I'm an artist and collaborator at 510 Crane. We're an art collective in Oakland, California. And I'm just gonna show you a few pictures of works that I've done and works that the group has done. And there's a couple of threads that run through them. The first is that they're experiential. You need to be there uh, to really experience them. And the second is that they're all created by groups of people, and usually by very large groups of people. So let me jump in with, uh, this is 2004. I was invited by a good friend of mine to camp at Burning Man for the first time. Uh, we were at a theme camp right on the Esplanade. I was really 
thrown into the middle of it, and I had an amazing time. Um, I ran around and saw art. I met up with my friends and have many, many stories from that week. However, at the end of that week, some friends and I decided that we wanted to build an art car for the next year. So we all got together and we dreamed up a 15 by 20 foot um, Wild West saloon on wheels. It was battery powered and it rolled around silently. And as expected, we, as expected, we got to roll around together and have this amazing experience. What I didn't expect is that when we got on board without planning it, we all showed up and discovered our alter egos. <laughs> we were suddenly a group of, of sheriffs and saloon girls and Wild West characters and dancers and we played music and if you came on board, you were playing on our playground and you were playing along. <laughs> we were trouble. So the following year, uh, we needed to spiff it up. It needed some repair work and we ended up at a different place to repair it at an um, now defunct, well at least defunct in that location, warehouse in West Oakland called NIMBY. And this place was full of people making amazing things and most of it for Burning Man. Our neighbors there were a group called Kinetic Steamworks. And their mission was to repurpose vintage steam equipment and use it to power new kinetic art. They were bringing a carousel, a bug carousel out, out that year that you could ride. And I thought that was really cool. So after Burning Man that year, I, I met up with them and I decided to, to join the group and I became a, a boiler operator and a restorer. I, you know, learned a lot about how to clean this out. This is Hortense, she's a, a case traction engine. Um, so from there, one of the members of Kinetic Steamworks, Sean Orlando, uh, wasn't satisfied just restoring this equipment. He also wanted to build the art that it powers. So he dreamed up this maybe 40 foot tall tree house that you can climb up the trunk and go in, inside and and play. And so there's Hortense, and there's a steam-powered calliope in there, and there's steam effects that ooze out of the branches at night, and this is a big collaboratively built project. There were probably 30, 40 people that worked on the project, not including on the steam side. And at the end of that year, all of the people that worked together not only loved the project, but realized that they loved each other. And they wanted to formalize, we wanted to formalize this group uh, so that we can continue building together. And that's when Five Ton Crane was born. By the way, the treehouse is now not far from here in Milton, Delaware, permanently installed at Dog Fish Head Brewery. So. <laughs> okay, so meanwhile, back at the saloon, uh, we had brought it out a number of years and it was uh, pretty, pretty worn out and we thought, wouldn't it be cool to take this platform that we'd spent a lot of time building and, and build something else on top of it? Let's, let's create a new playground. And we dreamed up this uh, Art Deco movie theater. And this is about back in 2008 or so. And someone in the group said, wouldn't it be neat if, if a few people in the group made a one to two minute silent film that we could play in this theater? I, I hadn't thought about that. But wow, that sounded like a really fun thing to do. Um, Soon it became evident that while everyone in our group wanted to have this theater to roll around in, nobody had the time or energy or, or interest in actually building it. And my biggest disappointment there was that I wouldn't get to make a short film. But why not? Why not? I'll skip that one. Why not, uh, why not make it anyways? So here I started planning it and, and this was my first First time actually being a, a lead artist on something, on being the only person or the main person who's just driving it forward and has to get everyone else involved and drag everyone else into this project and, and keep the momentum going. And so four years later, I had a 25 minute silent film and I managed to rope about 100 people into working on it with me. And it was the hardest thing I had ever done. And so satisfying, um, so immensely wonderful. 
Thank you. So soon after that, I, I met back up with Five Ton Crane in time to work on the Nautilus submarine. This is another art car. Um, <laughs> yay. Uh, it, it is um, an immersive environment, and you can go inside. Um, that door right there opens up, and you can climb on top. It drives from on top, and it's a lot of fun to roll around on. Uh, for that project, I was the interior designer and interior project manager, and not only was it fun to actually build things for it, but I really enjoyed collaborating one-on-one -on -one with a number of different artists on pieces that they created for this interior. Um, and I think, I think they did a really amazing job, um, and my job was to sort of just work with them and keep the whole thing cohesive so that it didn't look like 50 people had built it. It looked like one piece of artwork, although about 50 people worked on it. So next I thought, I, I had this idea kicking around for, uh, for a boot. Uh, this is called Storied Haven, and it is meant to evoke the feeling that you have when you're a little kid and you get tucked into bed and someone you love reads you a story or a fairy tale. Uh, and you can go inside and you can explore it at your own pace. There's a library inside. Uh, here it is in Santa Rosa, California, where it's currently living. And here it is landing on Playa for the first time. So this brings us to our most recent project, which is the Capitol Theater, realized finally 10 years later. There it is. Uh, I was co-lead artist with Sean Orlando and about 50 people put their, their creativity and their energy um, and their hard work into building this. It, um, it was really a labor of love. And it is in the Renwick right now for, I think, two more days. Um, meanwhile, uh, we decided to create a couple more movies. There's not only the picnic playing in that theater, but there's two new movies that I've made with my movie-making partner, Alan White, um, under the name Obsolete Pictures. And we have three more in post-production that will debut in Cincinnati uh, later in the spring. So all of these have been amazingly rewarding, but there is one project that has been, I think, the most rewarding, and that is us. It is the community that we have built through Five Ton Crane and beyond that means the most. We work together, we play together, oh, sorry, um, and we love each other. So if today or at any point anybody is inspired in to make art or make more art or build something, then go and make art. But beyond that, if you're inspired, go out and build and strengthen your community because that is by far the most rewarding part. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Brie Hilkeba from Five Ton Crane, and now we'll have Carolyn Mills, known as Mills, typically, from Flaming Lotus Girls. Hi. So first, as, a, as an image guru as I am, I'm very sorry about the resolution on this image. I will, it is not quite correct, but we'll carry on. Uh, I'm going to start a story which actually also ties back into Dave X's story this morning, if people heard. So on the left here, this is actually the namesake of the Flaming Lotus Girls. This is Flaming Lotus Senior. It was a liquid fuel effect. In the background, you can see Charlie's um, paintings that Dave was talking about setting on fire. And it started in 2000. It actually started with um, four people. Did you say four? Yeah, three girls, one boy. Dave X was one of them. And the reason they wanted to do this, to do the Flaming Lotus Girls, is they wanted to make the big boom flame effects at Birdie Man pretty. So the ICP that you saw earlier that Dave was, where Dave presented, he didn't actually tell you what the name of that thing was. I would like to tell you. It was the Impotence Compensation Project. <laughs> And it was 
wonderful. Big boom around the man. But my girls and Dave wanted to make pretty things. So we came up with the Flaming Lotus Girl. This is prior to Mills. I came along in a minute and I'll show you. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do a really quick trip through our portfolio. Um, I'm going to, one word, two words about each of them because we don't have too much time. I'm happy to answer questions later. But what I want you to get from this is the breadth of the, of the work, the differences in each one of the work. And the reason that they are so, so different is because of the collaborative model that we have. So each piece is basically made by different people in a large amount of, in, in, in a large amount of ways. So there could be 50 people working on one sculpture one year, 50 people working on the other, and there may be only 10 of us that cross over. So it's a very fluid group. Uh, the way that we make our decisions is very fluid, um, and you can really see that from the body of work. <coughs> so this is the hand of God. Um, she's a sculpture representation of a, of a female's hand. Um, she has been on Playa, she's been in Amsterdam, she's been on Australia. Uh, this is the Seven Sisters. Um, the photo in the top right is actually the reason I am a Flaming Lotus girl, because I happened to cross them on Dawn in 2004, took a photo, they wanted it, and then asked me to be a Flaming Lotus girl, and I fell on my knees going like this, going, please. That was 15 years ago. I don't know whether I'd make the same decision again. Um, so this is the Angel of the Apocalypse. This is actually my photo, and this is the first piece that I worked on with the Flaming Lotus girls. Um, the Serpent Mother. <laughs> this is the first flame effect that I ever designed. <laughs> Boom. Um, here's Mutopia, which was a crazy assess thing with probably like five or 6,000 different propane hoses and so many fittings. It was a propane effect. It was our propane. This is what, this is what it's going to be. It's fuel, fuel, fuel. Then we sort of changed a little. Here's Soma. Uh, Soma was, was more where we started incorporating LEDs and different kinds of fire and LED um, parts into our sculptures. Um, she's been all over the place too, but she's also been permanently installed in San Francisco on Pier 14, up on the right. Uh, and then actually she's currently installed in Vallejo, which is my hometown, because I wanted it, so I made it happen. <laughs> That's how we work. Um, here's Timpani Lambada. She is a sculpture representation of the inner ear. Those arches there are 40 feet tall. This was a sculpture when I, was, um, I wasn't completely involved, where I told them they had to fit it in one 40-foot shipping container, and all of a sudden it's two 40-foot shipping containers, which I still have words with them about. And this is xylophage, which was like a mushroom forest. A pulse, a representation of the human heart. Noetica, um, and so how do we do this, right? We do it with lots and lots and lots of dedicated individuals who are willing to learn, awfully, often very different folks from build to build. People with skills who are willing to share and teach and willing to return to the trenches when we've forgotten how to do a thing again. And skills built along the way. So this is Miss Margaret here. And she figured out how to rig a 40-foot inner ear. It's pretty impressive. Um, we do it in dedication in all weathers. So this is in Calgary. We were rained on, we were snowed on, there was dirt, and we're still smiling. We also know, we also have the technical knowledge now in how we do this safely. Um, so this is one of our fuel depots. It's my favorite part. <laughs> this is a bit that I'm mainly responsible for in the logistics. Um, hence talking about scientists versus, versus artists. I'm the kind of scientist that cat wrangles all the artists into hopefully making these things happen. But ultimately, very similar to Brie, it's possibly the most important than, than any of that. It's doing it with the most amazing family that you could ever think of. These are my family, these are my friends, these are my confidants. Um, again, they change from, from month to month, from year to year, but still, they're amazing, and I would never be without them. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn Mills, and now we'll welcome Kate Rosenbush. Any day now. Uh, okay. Um, okay. As a DC-born artist, 
I grew up seeing the power of Washington's monuments and spaces as testaments to our history and our ideals. Here, art tells a story of our evolution as a nation. Art here and around the world and at Burning Man is a conduit through which our humanity understands itself. I create with the belief that conscious creativity has a connective awakening force, sharing the conviction that throughout our human history, artistic expression and invention is an indicator of an evolved society. This free expression shows an awareness of our own identity, belief systems, as well as connection to both earthbound and spiritual presence. <laughs> Visiting the Smithsonian Museum's countless times growing up in the DC atmosphere, I vividly remember visiting Alexander Calder a retrospective three times in one weekend <laughs> at the East Wing of the National Gallery of Art in 1998. I remember bursting into tears when I saw this particular artwork, Bayonets Menacing a Flower. <laughs> and this is actually a, an askew thing. It's actually that, that flower comes out and just goes in space and it's way on the other side. Um, um, Bayonets Menacing a Flower created at the close of World War II in 1945. I was struck with gratitude that a sculptor could comment on our complicated humanity with such an economy of line and still gracefully encapsulate the threat of violence and the fragility of peace. Where, I wondered, <laughs> were the other creatives commenting on our society like this today? Had artists succumbed to purely commercial enterprises? No, all I knew was that there was no living rebels <laughs> to be found in my hallowed halls in the National Gallery of Art. And so, the next year, I ventured out to a desert of 40,000 feet elevation in the midst of a gorgeous nowhere to find them. I discovered over the next 19, 19 years of desert pilgrimages that creative evolution exists at the growth edge of risk. At that time, I was working as a professional photographer and I tried in vain to capture the ineffable qualities of this place. I had zero plans to make sculpture, let alone knowledge of welding or fabrication. But after five years of merely documenting this experience, it was time for me to give back and instead create an experience for others. From 2004 onward, I learned how to design and fabricate sculpture. I was obsessed. <laughs> I was supported by Burning Man with honorarium grants to create the art that brings this surreal Salvador Dali landscape to life. We were fortunate that Burning Man was quickly becoming the largest supporter of large scale art in the country. Futures past the sculpture here in DC on the corner of Pennsylvania and I Street, if you haven't seen it already. Um, was made in 2010 for the Metropolis theme at Burning Man. To illustrate the life of cities, I chose to imagine the future trajectory of a civilization that worshiped and built temples to their gods of technology, but forgot to honor the original source code of the earth. It is meant to be a cautionary tale, an architectural ruin found in the future. It is an allegory that speaks to the sustainability of our own technological advancement and asks, asks us to consider the system circuitry of our planet can also be found in the roots of the trees that we are currently chopping down. As shown in the hourglass at the center of the altar, the future's past is now. But what was the source of all this inspiration for so many of us all these years? Ooh, I'm so sorry. There's still more futures past. Here it is in DC. They made me change the lights to blue because the DOT didn't want people to be confused with the traffic light green of the sculpture. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. And then it's under a street lamp, so it doesn't really matter. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so what was the source of the inspiration? Da -da. Um, the intellectual impetus of these imaginings was Larry Harvey. 
the founder and the creator of new thematic genius every year of the festival. He was the true north of Burning Man. His thematic machinations challenged us to frame creative expressions that formed a kind of collective consciousness and in turn created artworks that were in dialogue with his ideas. This is always the hard part. <laughs> he was my greatest artistic muse, a catalyst, a philosopher, a conductor of a mad symphony of misfit artists. All of us resonating and connecting with each other on a vast white sheet music of dust, where like music, it is played on only in the present moment and then it is gone. I created a tribute to Larry Harvey this year called Bassage Home, where five symbolic pentagons aligned from the man to the sun. They held the map of our city and receded into the skyline where Larry Harvey, silhouetted in the last frame, steps into the sunrise. The sun aligned with all five portals on the last day, and then it was ritually burned and released with a temple on Sunday. I have been blessed <laughs> to learn from so many talented and wonderful people who worked with me side by side to reach and realize these artworks over the 15 years I've been making art for Burning Man. Architects, engineers, metal workers, carpenters, riggers, heavy equipment <laughs> operators, pyro esper experts, Dave X, thank you. <laughs> um, lighting designers, laser cutters, my God, trucking companies, interactive tech experts, just to name a few. And yet, my work is not conceived by a collective organization. I'm not that organized. <laughs> Instead, my artwork is often conceived in a visionary experience that is a mystery still to me. Like philosophy made physical, I feel the most important element of the art work is their allegorical idea behind it that becomes a conduit to question our humanity in myriad ways. In this case, questioning the American dream itself. Altered state, pictured here, points out that the dreams of the native peoples were destroyed to make way for our own. It is a giant bird cage, the shape of the US Capitol Dome, yet skinned in laser cut steel with the eagle imagery of the Pacific North West, bleh, Northwest Coast First Nations tribes. A three level bird swing at the center leads to a feathered roof reminding us that the eagle is also a symbol of spiritual reach, not just hegemony. And I did research actually for this at the Museum of the Native American on, on the mall. And from that library there, you can actually look out and see the Capitol Dome from their library. Um, Uh, Braindrop was actually a self-funded project, one of my own self-funded projects, besides the one I made for Larry. And this one was built as a meditative space to honor the element of water. And I, since it's so simple to install, it's only 17 feet tall, every time I was asked to install it on different festivals, it rained. <laughs> and I, I'm not just like, oh, Ding, 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 ding. No, like torrential rain, we're closing the festival, done. You know, people getting struck by lightning, floods, and it was really weird. I mean, I should just, like, put this in the desert somewhere. I don't know. Somewhere there's a drought. I'm bringing the sculpture. <laughs> um, um, dual nature. This early sculpture was made in 2006 when I first learned how to weld steel. It exemplifies the source of my greatest fear and my greatest hope, us, human beings. This 38 foot wide, two-sided spiraling circle illustrates the destructive force of human nature in steel, back to back with the blood red mirror of the bond that unites us all, the life force of our shared DNA. 
traded for the environmental green man theme, Guardian of Eden imagines the lotus flower of Hindu creation myth. It invites us to climb into the symbolic seed of creation like the god Brahma and imagine if we could recreate the world, what kind of world would it be? What lessons would we apply next time? How could we make it better? How could we make us better? This sculpture was purchased yay, by the Nevada Museum of Art in 2007 and was the first sculpture commissioned by Burning Man to become part of the permanent collection of a US museum. Hey. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> That's such a great museum. David Walker and Wolf, thank you so much. Um, okay, Starseed. So <laughs> for Fertility 2.0 theme in 2012, I imagine Burning Man culture itself growing out of its roots in the desert and becoming a seed pod that pollinates the world with its etho ethos and art. This 42-foot tall sculpture sat on three root-like legs that held a 22-foot tall parabolic staircase. The climb started off innocently enough, <laughs> but then became so treacherously narrow and without railings that some turned around and gave up. But the seed pod above was such a beautiful bower of delight that if you pushed through your fear, you were rewarded by three cushioned loun lounges held aloft by three giant leaves and a canopy of shade high above the dust storms. In a very real way, if you got to the top, you allowed your love of beauty to conquer your fear and self-doubt. Helios was inspired by the Leonardo da Vinci Vitruvian man drawing as a gesture of self-actualization. One of the top, um, a hierarchy, a hierarchy of needs and Maslow's hierarchy is self-actualization. And I wanted to speak to that with this gesture of the Vitruvian man. Um, we were invited to write down our highest aspirations at a central altar and then through a collective ritual which produced beacons of light, Helios illuminated and connected our aspirations and illustrated the power of communal effort. And what I didn't expect, actually, at, at, at when I was conceiving this sculpture is that you had to hold on for like a minute straight and not let go. Um, six people in a row, and, and at the same time, simultaneously, had to hold on like this. And what I didn't expect was, A, people were going to give up if they weren't encouraged. And what was amazing is that the community came in and cheered them on. They're like, don't give up, you can do it, hold on, da, da, da. And then all the beams would cross and then you would get your light beam returned to you in a circle um, of light at the end of that one minute. And so the light that you put out into the world, if it's encouraged by others, um, eventually gets returned back to you. And that was the metaphor of the sculpture. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so at the week's end, all of the intentions inside the altar were released by a ritual fire into the night sky. And I have Dave X to think, thank for that. <laughs> um, but there is a lot of art that I've made that is actually beyond the playa, because everyone always asks, is that all you do at Burning Man? I'm like, as if that's not enough. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so in Korea, South Korea, um, I was asked to create a sculptural space for a collective meditation. And I wondered, was there some kind of unseen connection when we meditate together? What if a sculpture could be a conduit for a meeting of the minds on some astral plane? And so, um, when you looked up inside the sculpture, it revealed a design that evoked this idea of meditative oneness. Uh, Wishing Tree went on a world tour with the Mystery Land Festival in 2014. Um, and um, it, I asked if this festival goer is kind of like the temple to make a wish to heal our world. And they were given the opportunity to write down their thoughts and dreams on the thousands and thousands of leaves that were hanging from this tree. And they got to witness wishes from 
three continents, and they got to see that their wishes were not so far removed from the wishes of people in Amsterdam, in Santiago, Chile, in New York. And it created an oasis of peace at each festival where people stayed for hours. Um, Thank you, PowerPoint conversion. <laughs> I did this in keynote. Um, Mystery Land stage, they, uh, they asked me to do, do uh, main stage design, um, which was based on the hummingbird. And gathering for dance is a human ritual as old as fire. And for this stage design, I wanted to create a place that uplifted people as they lost themselves in the present moment, drinking the nectar of life in the dance. Transition Portal. This was a public art commission from the Nevada Department of Transportation last year. This 30-foot tall gateway sculpture welcomes all to the largest tech park in the United States, home of the Tesla Gigafactory. Yeah, Elon, have you seen this? <laughs> it was a melding of core ten and stainless steel, and each cutout was created as a modern hieroglyphic illustrating the story of humanity, humanity's uh, evolutionary path. The sculpture is a symbolic rite of passage to honor humanity's transition to a sustainable and harmonious technological future. And lastly, this is a rendering. This is a sculpture to be found in DC in the near future. Axis Mundi, with the support of the Golden Triangle Business uh, Development um, District, um, this obelisk sculpture will rise at Farragut Square Park in March of next year. Access Mundi will hold space in Washington where the world comes together to create a better government, a better country, and hopefully a better future. <laughs> the patterns of the base of the obelisk are the patterns of the radial starlight streets of Washington. At its core, Access Mundi reflects the vital center of the city, its people. A large mirrored spiel reveals us at the core of the obelisk, reflecting the here and now Axis Mundi asks us, what does it mean to work here at the axis of one of the world's most vital cities? And most importantly, what is our role in upholding its ideals to make a better world? That's it. <laughs> Perhaps we can move into the center of the stage and you can bring the lights up in the center. Thank you. So I know I asked each of you to sort of speak for about five minutes and um, I'm wondering, Mills and Bree, having heard each other, um, you went through at a rather rapid clip if you now feel like there's some things that you might have wanted to add um, if you had some more time. Um, I'm happy moving into the discussion part. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So one of the things that Stephanie Stiebisch mentioned this morning was uh, the conditions that are created on the playa um, and the one that's most frequently remarked upon is the landscape and the scale. And Kate, I loved it when you said that something was only 17 feet. Um, <laughs> yeah, in Burning Man standards. Yeah. <laughs> um, 70 feet, seems 70, 80 feet seems to be about the highest of most of the work that I've seen in the few years I've been working there. But um, so the scale is an evident um, portion of this, this response to the landscape. But when I was talking to the three of you, I was also hearing that there are a bunch of other conditions that you feel contribute to the creation of work for yourselves and potentially other artists. And I wondered if uh, each of you would mind speaking to that. Um, sure, um, I think there's so many. Uh, there's a number of different things that make creating art out there a unique experience and a unique place. Um, 
one of the things that I really appreciate is that beyond the honorarium grants, that anyone can bring art. It is not curated. You, you have to follow a couple basic safety rules. I think there are two. And then you, you can have an idea. You can make it happen by yourself with a bunch of people. It can be small. It could be a tiny thing, and you can bring it. And that lack of curation means that anyone can go out and be inspired and, and bring something. And it's not an elite collection of, of people. You don't have to be an artist. And, um, and it is that variety that I think makes it accessible to everyone. Um, you don't have to think, I have a genius idea that the art world will love. You might think, this thing might be silly. Oh, wouldn't it be funny if we made that thing? Uh, all ideas are, are welcome and, and will be beloved by someone. One of the things you just mentioned was about the sort of the art world. And when we were talking before, you talked a little bit about the kind of people that come together to do the work that you do. Could you speak a little bit more about uh, what is an artist as it pertains to Burning Man? <laughs> wow. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'm quite qualified to answer that. But what I, I can answer is that <laughs> Uh, who, who is an artist at Five Tongue Crane? Because, you know, I, I know who's there. And uh, all of our projects are geared towards a group. There's a, a, an intentionality in making them multidisciplinary so that everyone can participate. So there are ceramic elements, there are textile elements, there's wood and metal and... Um, there's, there's just a lot for anyone to do, and if there's someone in the group that does something specific, we'll, we'll try to find a way to incorporate it if we can. So these are people that, in some cases, are full-time artists, and in other cases, are any number of other professions. Um, it's, it's not really relevant to us in, in that way. You just, you come, you participate. Well, you're part of Five Tongue Crane. So I just, um, in one moment, we'll bring the first question back to you, Mills. But Kate, you've spoken really eloquently about um, the dynamic of the relationship between yourself and the theme and Larry. Are, you feel free to speak more about that, but I think you also find other things about the context of Burning Man, um, an invitation and compelling um, for the that creates this kind of condition for your work. Can you speak a bit about that? What I love about Burning Man is not this elite thing. You know, there's not kind of this a hierarchy of, well, I'm sorry, you don't know the director of the blah, 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 and you have to have a portfolio review. Honestly, the, in 2004, when I submitted my first art grant proposal, it was, no one asked for your resume. <laughs> it was, okay, you have a plan, you have a budget, and uh, you're not gonna hurt anyone and clean up after yourself. Great, <laughs> you know? Um, it was wonderful, and, and I also think it's a place where um, women in particular are, are <laughs> rise to their righteous place as powerful beings. And, and I, yeah, it is, it, it, it's amazing. You don't feel the um, misogyny there that you do in other art fields in the default world. And that is such a massive relief. And I think also how, why women really thrive at Burning Man. I mean, the woman who did the trenching on a trencher, okay, for my, my artwork this year was the most, amazing goddess riding on this chariot, dragging a trench in the ground like this. And the people uh, that were uh, new to the playa that year that were happened to be there talking to me, just their jaws just ha hung open. She was in a mini skirt and she had, I don't know what else she was wearing. It was made tattoos, it was awesome. And she's like, yeah, I'm just doing a trench. It's great. And, I, and it, was, it, was, it was amazing, but there's no, uh, Roles you have to fill this role because you are this or that you can be anything and so it's just wide open there like the desert 
And Mills, you wanted to speak to both the original question and also I think to some of what Bree was talking about. Can you share with us about yeah. what the conditions are that create the art that's happening at Burning Man? Yeah, I think for the I think for the Flaming Lotus Girls, you know, it like it took me a very long time, probably even only like eight years ago for actually call myself an artist. Like I've been a science track ever since I was five years old, right? So um, I showed up and just the, everything was there. I just required a little bit of organization to make the larger and larger and larger pieces, right? So it's not just artists, it's people from all different works of life. It's photographers, it's garbage men. It's like, it's like everybody comes together to make these pieces. And what I really appreciate about the Flaming Lotus Girls process is that anybody can put their hand in the ring about what they want to make. So it all starts, you know, no, October, November, December time. People put ideas in the ring, and there could be like 10 different ideas. And then you start to see a little co coalescing around these different ideas. Then a couple of weeks later, we come back and we write a bigger proposal, and then there's more coalescing. And we end up with usually like four, two or three page proposals. And those proposals then get voted on by the group, and the winner then goes forward. But that's still not the end of the design process, because you know, very similar to the Five Ton Crane crew as well, is there's always elements of each of the sculptures that are left to individual people to design themselves. So for Soma, for example, little tiny blubs on the end of each one of the dendrites, they were all very custom. They were all made by different people and different people got to, got to incorporate their own art in that space, right? So it's like art within art within art for, with people who are not classically trained artists. So for example, Noetica was designed by the uh, chief medical officer of the Department of Surgery in like a Santa Clara hotel hospital, right? <laughs> so it, it's like this, This I think that what Burning Man manages to do is blur the line between what is an artist and like what is an artiste, right? And an artist, like we are all artists. We create our own canvas. We can, um, we can express ourselves in so many different ways, whether that be through participation with a group or, you know, one thing the Flaming Lotus Girls are really good at is people getting really annoyed at us. <laughs> and then running off and going making their own art, which is great, because then you get more art, and it's like art, art, art. <laughs> there you go, thank you. <laughs> I love it. I, uh, when we spoke on the phone, it was really fun to hear the three of you begin to know each other better. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationships among artists on Playa and the role that that plays in the ultimate experience for either an artist or a participant? you would like to. Okay. okay. Uh, the desert is, as, as many of you know and have heard, it is a harsh environment. And s what happens is unexpected. You, you don't exactly plan for, for what is going to happen. And that brings its own magic because you you're working and, and someone from another project that's setting up comes over and you know, they, they forgot a sledgehammer. Can they borrow their, your sledgehammer? Well, of course you can borrow a sledgehammer. Here you go. And then uh, later on I'm gonna go over and pick it up and I'm gonna see what you're doing and ask some questions and get to know the people there. Uh, the amount of support that you get um, from other artists, from artists you have known for a decade and artists you never met until two minutes ago is unlike anything I'd had experienced anywhere else. People are willing to pitch in. If your crew is finished with your project and they're running late, hey, you need some help? We've got, we've got some people that can do that. We've got an extra welder. We've got whatever we have, and you can use it too. Uh, so that type of support and community through building and through helping each other um, is really unparalleled. Yeah, and if I can add a, a little to that, uh, you know, my role at Burning Man has changed a little in the group as well over the last couple of years. I had a kid, I take the kid out there, I do all my participation before the child arrives, and then once the child arrives and my partner, then, then that's my life there. And the last couple of years, it's really changed into more of like a support group. The, we're basically the plumbing store of the playa. <laughs> so, so this year, I swear, between three Flaming Lotus girls, we probably gave a five or six hundred dollars worth of parts out. It's not the money; I'm just expressing like what we're giving, right? Um, and probably 21, 22 different art projects came to us 
to ask us for help for for that one fitting that like they'd have to send somebody all the way back to Reno to get and I just hand it to them and the smile on the face is like they're like they've been panicking and panicking and running around the desert and trying to find this thing and you hand it to them and it's the most amazing feeling because you know we're, we're again more art <laughs> I know I'll keep, I'll keep saying this um, but the way that we support each other and we, we all know each other and, and, and where our groups know each other. And admittedly, we haven't, all three of us here, have not actually hung out in the same space before, but we've definitely circled around each other a lot over yeah. many years. And this is really amazing to see. Um, the community that we've created is, is fantastic and I don't think I'd be who I am without it. I, I agree, uh, absolutely across the board. Um, I, I met uh, a dear friend of mine, Michael Christian, one of like the longest running artists at Burning Man. He's amazing. Um, because I, radical self-reliance, unfortunately, did not bring a ladder. And I saw him off in the distance building this weird wiggly thing. And I'm like, this guy has a ladder. He looks prepared. So, <laughs> and he was. And I said, hey, I'm sorry, can I borrow your ladder? I don't have, you don't have a ladder? What are you making over there? and back and forth and I borrowed the ladder and we've been friends ever since and he sort of mentored me like here are the logistics that you need to understand about Burning Man and this and this and, and we share information it's not competitive actually because you're surviving I always tell people to per you have to remember that Burning Man is 50% survival and logistics 50% for real especially even more so when you're building art out there it's not just you go and you, unless you're turning a key in an RV and everything's fine, whatever. That's not really Burning Man anyway. But anyway, <laughs> it's true. Anyway, so I, but, um, but, but you have, you have this, this sense that we're all in this together. And it's like Larry said, the shared struggle that bonds you together. And when I was building Helios, I, <laughs> There was a team member that didn't show up and he had a lot of tools <laughs> that were supposed to be there for us. And I thought, oh my God. So we had extra forklift from district. We had extra wood from, yes. <laughs> extra uh, wood from Catacomb of Vales. We had some parts from dear friend PK Kimmelman c come in at the last minute. Love him, always love him. And, um, and, it w and, and so the, the Helios was actually built by the community <laughs> coming together and going, oh my God, she's not gonna build this without our help, we'll do it. <laughs> so it was amazing. So you end up building this sculpture out of blood, sweat, tears, and gratitude. And so, yeah, that's how, that's how Burning Man art is built. <laughs> yeah. You end up building this art out of blood, sweat, tears, and gratitude. That's incredible. Um, one of the things that's been really exciting for me, we didn't really talk about this except a little bit beforehand, but has been the opportunity to work with and develop the art support services team and the fire art safety teams. And um, what, is the, what is the dialogue between Burning Man Project and, and artists? Are we, are we throwing you out there on your own, by yourselves? Are we staying out of it? Are we helpful? I, I suppose I should ask for this feedback somewhere much more private, but um, <laughs> feel free to be candid um, because we're, it's iterative, right? We're learning by doing as well. Um, so I was, a, I am, and still are a member of the FAST team, so I suppose I'm like an insider a little bit. Um, I've also been friends with a lot of people in the artery. Um, so I think those personal relationships make it relatively easy for us as Flaming Lotus Girls. Um, I think that the over the last few years, that the level of organization has definitely improved and it's a much easier process to go through the artery. Um, but we're still in the middle of the desert and we're making art, right? I think that if it's not, if not saying that it's difficult, but if, it's, if something is not difficult, then it's not really worth that doing out there. That sounds kind of weird, but... <laughs> I, I, making something, it's not like walking into a store and getting something, right? It has to be, it has to be wanted and has to be grasped and has to be given on both sides. Um, 
So I'm very happy with the support that we get from, from the archery and fast. Um, it's, and sometimes it can be frustrating, but realistically we're in the middle of a desert and we're all doing this together. And volunteers are running it the same way as volunteers are running our art. Um, so. It's interesting, Jeremy Crandall, who many of you probably know, talks about having an indigenous language of how to make things and how to help each other make things. And finding the line, I mean, between the support that is needed for safety and connectivity, sort of that people know what resources each other has and that kind of thing, and but still maintaining a balance in such a way that this, this very special part of people finding and helping each other doesn't get lost because we come become so well organized that um, we're robbing people of this experience of, you know, it's, it's, it's just a fire. You say that much better dance. than I just did, exactly. No, that. I mean, it's a dance, really, it's a dance, totally. because we want to be there, and we also don't want to overwhelm and um, and lose sight of this very special something that, that is happening. So each of you are leading groups that are collaborative, um, but in very different ways. Can you talk a little bit about your leadership model and how you go about sort of from concept to realization? Um, what, what is involved? If, if we're talking about co-creative process as a part of what it means to make art at Burning Man, like that, that you just said 50% is logistics and survival. A certain amount is also leadership. Um, and, and what does that look like and how do you manage that um, each of you in your own way. <laughs> uh, so, so I guess I could start with how uh, a five-ton crane project comes into existence and that how it has happened so far is not necessarily indicative of how it will happen in the future. But someone has an idea. It's usually something that one or two people have come up with and their job as, as the leader, or my job as the leader, is to inspire and communicate the project, to communicate the world that we're creating uh, so that people can jump in and offer up other ideas and, um, and that it can evolve um, sort of within a framework. And also to leave opportunity for other people to participate. Um, so something that I did for the first time on the boot, because I we had a lot of engineering to do, and I wanted to keep people excited and get people working on something right away. And I had this idea for a library, and that I, I got um, you know 200 old books, which are surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, very cheap, uh, and gave them out to people who could then cut into them and create individual works of art inside of these books. And to use the title of the book as an inspiration, but do whatever they want inside, as long as it closes and looks like a book when they're done. You don't, ha you know, you don't need a special skill, and we, we did that, uh, we had some parties, and we did that as a group, and people did it on their own, and it just got people started right away. So that's something that we continued on in the Capitol Theater with uh, film canisters, and people filled those with things relating uh, to the project as a whole. So that, that's one thing we do. How do we get people involved? How does everyone feel a part of this? Because when you go to work, you know, when you go to a job, the main motivation that you have to be there every day is financial. And that is not a motivation that we have for any of the projects that we've built. They are, for the most part, volunteer. So what do people get out of it? Well, we get an opportunity to build something that none of us could build by ourselves and to feel a part of that. And that is something that exists at Burning Man and so far beyond that, you, you know, I was waiting to get on the airplane to come here yesterday and I see a sweatshirt walk by from the boot. Like, oh, hey, you worked on this. Okay, that's, that's our community and that's, that's a sense of pride. Um, the, the projects that we work on are a sense of pride in our community, and we feel a part of that. We feel a part of it forever. And, and then there's the immediate community that we feel. And, and these are the types of, 
of um, the value that you get out of out of working on the projects. Um, and then leadership-wise, to, to be inclusive, to be decisive, make decisions, not waste people's time, um, and create a, a professional enough environment where people can have fun and play, but where we're also working. Um, so those are a few of few of the things that we do at Five Ten Crane. Sure. Um, so first of all, nobody's in charge. It's a total <laughs> renegade gang. Don't let you, anybody else think that like anybody's in charge of the Flaming Lotus Girls because nobody will take responsibility for that. Uh, renegade gangs, kind of like the mafia. Once you're in, you can never get out. Um, and our leadership style is fluid, to say the least. <laughs> And like I said, there are different lead artists every time. Those people are different each time. Um, there is different support support staff. S staff, that's not even the right word. Support people behind the scenes, too. Um, I've been one of those people for a long time. I led the project from Utopia um, in 2008, and they've done a bunch of ret retrofitting of the Serpent Mother. But like I said, there's different people in charge every time. And I think, again, the same way, inclusivity. Um, making sure that you are motivating your volunteers and you're keeping them engaged. Because like you said, if there's like major structural engineering to be done that only somebody who's welded on pipelines in Alaska can do, then you can't have somebody like with a little chintzy Monten Barbie welder do it, right? That's not gonna happen. So coming up with projects and parts of the projects that can be done in, um, in parallel um, with the main structural parts, planning it out, um, definitely years, year to year, we got much better at that. Um, because the projects are not completely designed when we start building them. Uh, sometimes that's a slight problem. Um, again, building the main structure of the work and then adding the small pieces on the top of it. A lot of it is organic as, as it comes through. Um, and you often find in the group that um, new leaders and, and new people who are excited to push the art forward just come out of the woodwork. So, you know, we, we don't have, we have this running joke of newbies of the year. Um, I was newbie of the year in 2005. Um, and you often find that these newbies of the year, you know, we usually haze them and do different things to them, but um, you often find that they are the people that stay around, right? So, like I said, Renegade Gang, can't get out once you're in. It's like the mafia. Uh, <laughs> um, but there's this core group of people that do stay together to make this art. Um, and then there's people who go away for five years and then come back and lead a huge project. Um, so fluidity, um, engagement, making everybody feel like they're part of a project. Um, and yeah, there we go. My style is totally different. I am not that organized to run an entire group. It's to, I, <laughs> for me, it is, um, I come up with this crazy idea that is just too hard to do, like, and I, I can't, you know, okay, hold on, let me start over again. I think like an architect. And I think like an architect that's using a structure to communicate an idea. And it is not something that is done for me by consensus, because I really hate design by consensus. <laughs> drives me insane. So I, I, I have this vision that, oddly enough, um, presents itself to me, and I don't really understand how it happens, but I have faith in that process. And I try to communicate that outwards, and it's by some awesome magic, all the right people are coalesce around this project. And it's different people every year, there's a lot of repeats, but it's, it becomes um, a, this amazing family of um, different people with different expertise. Like there's a lighting designer, there's the someone doing the CAD rendering, there's, there's uh, obviously the laser cutter that I've been using for 10 years, amazing. And, um, and then we 
we are bonded together, not so much that they are learning these things or putting all these to get things together, but that we're having a really good time believing in something together and believing that we're going to create some sort of magical experience to give as a gift to the people, our friends at Burning Man. And what sees you through all the really very difficult, crazy timeline, all that kind of stuff, is that the love of that idea has got to be stronger <laughs> than the incredible difficulty that uh, is involved when you bring something to Burning Man. And, and I'm not one of those um, art, uh, artists that kind of stand back and point and say, you do this and you do this and I'm gonna stand back here with a clipboard. <laughs> I am in the trenches, like getting really dirty, not sleeping, not even putting up my tent and sleeping in my car. <laughs> I mean, I'm like a, the, kind of like the general that is uh, going slightly insane and not sleeping until it's finished. <laughs> So, um, um, for better or worse, uh, that, that's how that's how my style is. Um, and but it actually it it, it actually ends up um, being an incredible bonding experience for everyone on the team. I mean, I think that's what's so incredible is that even though the approach may be entirely different, this coalescing around an idea and community formation happens regardless of whatever the you know the the entrance point is. 